Okay, on we go. Getting caught up with this week's uh, readings. This week is, this is week 10, Nudging and Captology. Um, and then the final one that I'll do next is on mediation slash distortion. Um, so th there's a couple little readings here on nudging and captology. I'm going to talk about the captology stuff first and then a little bit on nudging at the end there. Um, so we've got Fog. This is a couple of chapters from this book by B.J. Fogg called Persuasive Technology. Um, and then there's uh, just a op-ed piece, New York Times little piece on Cass Sunstein and his work on nudging. And I'm seeing these as related phenomenon, um, and we'll sort of get into some of that. So, all right, this, uh, this first two selections here, and by the way, I'm not going to post a prompt for the, th these readings because this stuff is coming from a like basic introductory textbook type approach to this content. And it has all of this kind of built-in promptiness. Uh, there's all these little reminders in the, the margins. And then at the end of the chapter, there's like summary of key terms and concepts. And there's nothing in there that I would need to add more in a prompt. So, you know, it's not terribly difficult stuff. Um, so you'll have the readings, you'll have this video, and that should do. Um, even though the second one, the second chapter from this book is chapter three is a little longer um it's easy and it moves quickly we'll see this all right so captology bj fogg uh this is coming out of a lab at stanford the persuasive technology lab i actually just looked it up a moment ago it's still fun running and it's still doing its thing i don't know actually when this lab got started but this is a at this point, a pretty like legendary academic space um, because what's going on in this lab is Fogg and his students are researching how it is that technology operates psychologically, um, consciously, unconsciously, as having the ability to move users, right, persuasively. So they're calling, he's calling this persuasion. And that's kind of why we're interested in it here is, you know, here's a class on thinking about language and thought and obviously the, the serious man approach, which is to be very cautious about what's coming at you and trying to sway you. And what we're trying to do at this point in the semester is get a, a pretty decent handle on just the sheer amount of environmental surrounding kinds of influences, right? So we just finished talking about spectacle We've talked about pseudo-environments. We've talked about how mediums shape their messages. That's McLuhan. This stuff here is a pretty much a direct extension of the McLuhan reading on this business of the medium as the message. So it's really looking at computer tech, computers as the medium and how it is that computers and the technologies that they use, the software, um, how in their engagements with users of the, the computer technology you can get people to do a lot of things by adopting these techniques that he talks about in the, the next chapter, in chapter three there. Um, so just a couple of broad overview type uh, stuff in this first chapter. Really what's going on, he, he wants to define, this is Fogg def, uh, just kind of introducing this, this new realm. This is published in 2003, so we're going back um, gosh, almost 20 years already. And this book is, is like the first kind of broad introduction to this notion that technology is persuasive. But you can tell that he's very cautious. And that's one of my main takeaways of this, this book, or at least these two selections, is that he's kind of tiptoeing into this discussion of the persuasiveness of technology, but being extremely cautious to not go too far. Um, and so he's defining things in a very limited, narrow, very tight way here. And sure enough, you can define persuasion in this way, but you're limiting what counts as persuasion to a very kind of narrow set of, of operations, right? So right off the bat, he says, I define persuasion as an attempt to change attitudes or behaviors or both in brackets without using coercion or deception, right? So the whole point that he wants to insist on is that persuasion is not deception if 
my intent is not to deceive. So it's a little circular here, right? It's like I, I'm my intent is to to as the sort of engineer of a of a technology, a computer technology or a software program, my intent is to persuade the user to become more adept at this program. Or like let's say it's one of these banking quick quick and loans or whatever uh, software programs, the persuasive intent is just to help the user save more money, do their taxes quicker, right? And so you're being helpful. That's the kind of the narrow range of persuasion that, that's being offered here. So, uh, and we'll get into the techniques in the next chapter, but he, he's very careful, right? It's persuasion is only persuasion if it's meant with the best of intention, <laughs> basically, right? So he's, he's trying to kind of clear away any uh, po space for, for challenge and critique here. So the next page, talking about captologies. This is this interesting new word, captology. So on page 16, he says, it seems clear that people interact both with and through computers depending on the situation. Captology, the study of computers as persuasive technology, focuses on human computer interaction. That's what he's interested in. So how it is that this thing that I'm talking into right now, how it was designed to help me, the user, do what I want to do more efficiently, effectively, smoothly, right? And, and basically just have a happier experience with my engagement. Specifically, Captology investigates how people are motivated or persuaded when interacting with computer products rather than through them. So he's not interested in what people do with computers that maybe they weren't designed to do, but you can use them in all these different kinds of powerful ways. He wants to kind of throw up his hands and say, that's not us, that's not on us, right? We're just talking very narrowly here about what these things are designed to do to be helpful in a persuasive way. All right, so the next section is persuasion is based on intentions, not outcomes. And he says, um, at the start of this chapter, I define persuasion as an attempt to change attitudes or behaviors or both. This definition implies that true persuasion whether brought about by humans or computers, requires intentionality. Captology focuses on the planned persuasive efforts of... Comp Notice the emphasis. He's very careful to like emphasize at the outset. Like, please, do not hold me accountable for anything that is not like our planned desired intention to help the user in some very specific way using psychological techniques that we know work in terms of like simplification and reduction and tailoring. We get to that in the next chapter. Intentionality is what distinguishes between a planned effect and a side effect of a technology. Okay. Next page over. Um, again, he talks about intention. That middle paragraph, uh, the second paragraph, says, Captology does not include such unintended outcomes. It focuses on the attitude and behavior changes intended by the designer's of interactive technology. So if there are unintended effects of our machines, sorry, that wasn't part of our intention. So it's not on us. You can't hold us accountable. It gets a little annoying after a while, frankly, how many times he's like, this is what we're focusing on. If anything else is not our fault, it's not our problem. It's just this narrow kind of window here. Um, and then he talks about endogenous and exogenous forms of persuasion. Captology focuses on endogenous intent, that is the persuasive intent that is designed into a computing product. It's explicit. It's part of the kind of coding of, of the product. A product also could acquire exogenous persuasive intent from users or another source. That is, if a product is adopted for a persuasive goal the designers hadn't planned. Not our problem. Not what we're responsible for here. Endogenous intended persuasion. Okay, good, good. Then he continues, we got macro and micro. And so he's interested in micro processes of persuasion. And on page 18, he lists a bunch Things like dialogue boxes, icons, interaction patterns between the computer and the user, um, micro-persuasive tactics that in involve simplifying, tracking, using graphs and illustrations. Frankly, it's the kind of stuff that you would learn about in a persuasion class that, like, for instance, Dr. Bloomfield teaches a class on persuasion. Or if you go back and you look at, you know... Tactics of Persuasion in Aristotle or Perelman and Ulbrecht's Titica. Like a lot of this stuff has been talked about in the literature on rhetoric and persuasion. It's just now being utilized 
with extra psychological analysis being utilized in these um, technological engineerings. Microsuasion in video games on page 19. I'm, my guess is that many, if not most of you, who are familiar with video games, probably play them, have them, enjoy them. I myself, I haven't played it in a while, but I have a system up in my room. Um, I don't have time to, to immerse myself anymore. My son um, actually doesn't have a system right now, but when he did, he, you know, he would just spend hours and hours and hours and hours. And the, these things are designed for maximum like engagement, just like the platforms. And persuasion is everywhere in there. Like, get the gold, do the thing, get the reward, level up, level up, go after that awesome weapon, get more points. It's all built in to keep you going, right? And it's and it's preying on your motivations, and it's preying on your desire to be better. And so video games are kind of like a whole special category of this stuff. But he talks about some of the, the tactics. So... At the end there, page 20, there's some summary of key terms. Um, it's all pretty simple, cut and dried stuff, I think. So then we move into chapter 3 on computers as persuasive tools. And you'll notice on the very second page, 32, he mentions seven types of persuasive technology tools. So we got reduction, tunneling, tailoring, suggestion, self-monitoring, surveillance, and conditioning are these types of ways of persuading users or kind of engaging them psychologically in ways that you're able to kind of, I don't want to say control, but sort of alter, modify, influence behavior, right? And obviously when you're having a conversation about a, a, a use of a tactic, a technique that's been informed by psychological research and analysis, and is working on an individual, on their mind, on their body, on their sort of predilections, unconscious desires and whatever, fears, um, there is a kind of possibility for concern, right? It's like, okay, uh, here I am, I'm coming into this experience with this thing, and I'm not an expert at it, but the people who created it are experts at it, and they're also experts at knowing what will engage me more, or how to get me to do this more smoothly, efficiently, right? One could argue that there's a kind of ethical question to be engaged in here in terms of like how it is that you are guiding and controlling my behavior. And as a, as a scholar of rhetoric, a critical scholar of rhetoric and influence, I'm someone who's concerned or at least would like to be conscious of and attentive to the, the different ways that I am being managed, you know. Maybe I think it's okay that I'm being managed in this way, but I do want to at least kind of understand the ways in which I am being managed um, persuasively, right? And so here's a discussion of seven types of tools, persuasive tools. And my, my sense is that he's actually arranged them from the kind of the least concerning, the least, the, the softest, the mildest form of kind of control to the like, the most extreme, like the final one, we start with reduction, which is basically just making things simpler, reducing a, a task to like easy, manageable processes, steps, right? And so that's like, thank you. You know, it's like if I have to do something and like when I, I used TurboTax for a number of years because who wants to do taxes, right? You get on tur TurboTax, it's like answers some questions. It's nice and easy. It looks simple. It's like pleasant. And it's just like, okay, 20 minutes later, I've done my taxes, right? So that's reduction. And then the last one is conditioning. Conditioning is like, I am, a, I am, I am act, actively modifying your behavior based on rewards and feedbacks. And there's a lot more kind of energy surrounding my persuasive management of your behavior there. So I do think there's a kind of an intensification of the persuasive control factor that's happening through these examples. So reduction, again, is persuasion through simplifying. This is 33. This is an example of a reduction strategy, making a complex task simpler. We've all done this online. We've, I don't know, signed up for an account um, or put in a credit card or personal information. I mean, how many times a week do we create new accounts? Do we have to go through these kind of seemingly a, a brainless tasks of like signing up for something or we, in order to get something, we need to go through a process and... I think a lot of us, I do, if, if it gets too complicated or too onerous, I'll just be like, I'm out, I don't care, I don't want it. 
I feel like I just did this recently. I was signing up for something. I was trying to sign up for something or I was just going to explore it. But it became like one step too cumbersome. And I was like, nope, I'm out. And if they had simplified it more and made it easier, then I would be, you know, engaged in their product. And so I guess, you know, from a perspective of trying to engage a user in the thing that you're trying to get them to use, you want reduce, you want simplification, right? It's necessary. So that's pretty mild. Um, tunneling. This is 34 at the bottom there. Using a tunneling technology is like ri riding a roller coaster at an amusement park. Once you get on the board, once you board the ride, you're committed to experiencing every twist and turn along the way. When you enter a tunnel, you give up a certain level of self-determination. So he's already starting to acknowledge the kind of like the, the question of agency and choice and ethics here because your agency is being kind of taken away from you. It's being taken over. It's being funneled and, ch and, and, and channeled through this tunneling business, right? And so we're already starting to get a little bit more extreme in terms of control. Um, but nevertheless, tunneling is also something that, you know, I think... Uh, TurboTax is like a tunneling thing. It's like once you start, you got to go through the, all of these little sections of the process. And it helps. It's better. It's easier than like getting the paper forms and trying to do it all yourself. But you're, you submit to the process, right? And in 36, it says, in essence, the user becomes a captive audience, right? So there is, again, this loss of agency, this loss of control. So that's why already on 37, he raises ethical concerns. <laughs> it's like, caution, caution, caution. He's being so cautious each step of the way. Like, let me address the ethical concerns and kind of argue it away and let's proceed. So he says at the end of that ethical section, to avoid coercion, designers of tunneling technology must make clear to users how they can exit the tunnel at any time without causing any damage to their system. So he really wants these persuasive tactics to be above board, to be helpful, useful. Here, they just exist because you want to engage in this program or this process, so like, let us help you, right? But if, if the user feels controlled, manipulated, then that's bad and we should like allow them to, to extract themselves. Um, next, we get tailoring. Right off the bat, it says, tailoring technology is a computer product that provides information relevant to individuals to change their attitudes or behaviors or both. Tailoring technologies make life simpler, right? Psychology research, notice the constant references to psychology. So again, this lab is really about kind of bringing together research on human psychology with analysis of the powers, the affordance powers of technology. It's important work. It's absolutely crucial. Um, but it, it seems to coexist in this space of like un, trying to analyze it to understand that in sort of an ethical way, but also creating research that is then exploitable, easily exploitable by uh, other companies to come along and just, you know, create bad versions of it, right? So it's a very fascinating laboratory that's both kind of good and potentially bad in terms of its discoveries. Um, so tailoring, what do we get next? We get more on ethical concerns on page 40. Um, very, very concerned to address the ethical questions at all times. Then we get suggestion technology on 41, intervening at the right time. Um, in the middle there it says, I define as an interactive computing product that suggests a behavior at the most appropriate moment. In rhetoric, we have this concept of kairos, right? It's like saying the right thing at the right time, knowing when it is appropriate to speak and to say just this thing in just this moment to address a problem to allay concerns or whatever there's a lot of that in here right knowing when a user is maybe about to step away or fade away or give up so a, a proper suggestion or a reminder or a you know, it's like you get these pop-ups sometimes when you're on Netflix for a long time. Hey, are you still watching? You know, the right kind of moment of like, come back. We want you back kind of thing. Um, yeah, they give the example of those posted. Here's your speed limit, right? It's like you're going into a school zone. So it's a right time for you to know that you are going 12 miles too fast. So that's like the, the way that they actually f physically place those signs is sort of about timing as well, right? Timing is critical. On 43, I wrote Kairos in the margins there. Um, next, we get self-monitoring technology. Is that one of the seven? Yeah, self-monitoring. Um, so this allows us to kind of 
use the tools at, at our disposal to kind of persuade ourselves, right? Like these wake up alarms. I have an Apple phone and it seems like with each update, there's newer and more sophisticated ways for me to manage myself, right? Like this sleep mode and you can set up these whole kind of schedules for yourself. And it's, it's weird. It's like you're offloading your own agency into the device, which then eight, agencies you agentially influences you in turn right so it's uh manipulating ourselves through our own devices pretty wild um let's see surveillance technology now we're moving into surveillance persuasion through observation uh i don't know if anyone out there has children but you if you don't you may soon or at some point and guess what we now have technologies where if our so my wife and i we have three kids we have one the youngest is 13 now so we don't do this with or she doesn't do it she has the phone control um i'm an apple user everyone else is android so amy has my wife has a uh, an ability to track the kids phones right she gets on her phone she pulls up a something and there have been times where we just did not know where the kids were or we we were expecting them to be somewhere and they weren't there or it's like we haven't heard from them for a few hours i gotta tell you it's pretty nice to be able to just pull up that thing and be like oh okay he's at the park okay good 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 like not to worry and so we're able to surveil them and that becomes useful for us um don't feel particularly good about it, and we always feel a little guilty whenever we spy on the kids, but it, it exists, right? It allows one party to monitor the behavior of another party to modify behavior in a specific way. So it's providing knowledge, knowledge data, essentially, data about where someone is, what they're doing. Based on that data, now I'm able to reach them. So I ex essentially become, um, let's see here. Yeah, sort of like the advertisers. Now that I have their personal data, I can appeal to them exactly where I need to. Why does my computer keep going blank? All right. Hopefully all's well here. Surveillance must be overt. Yes, ethical. It must be overt. Everyone must be aware of the fact. Like, so we tell the kids, if we can't get a hold of you, we are going to monitor your, where you are through the phone. It's like, sorry, but... You know, sometimes ethics have to be set aside when safety and concern is is in question. All right, so finally, I think, is reinforcing, conditioning technology is the last one. Yeah, conditioning. So we, we begin with reduction and simplification, and now we are at conditioning. Conditioning, as he mentions right off the bat, brings us into the realm of B.F. Skinner and this whole business of behaviorism. Right, which is using psychological tactics to literally condition behavior. Pavlov's, you know, dog and the ringing of the bell. We talked in this class about signals versus symbols. Signal manipulation is sort of what we're talking about here, right? It's like you ring the dinner bell. This is an old kind of rural thing. <laughs> ring, 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 and the kids come running because they know that it's dinner time and we're starving, kind of thing, right? So, in simple terms, operant conditioning is a method that uses positive reinforcements or rewards, right? Obviously, this is everywhere in video games. Um, so, getting back to the video, and this is on 51. While game designers rarely talk about their designs in terms of behaviorism, good gameplay and effective operant conditioning go hand in hand. Indeed, right? Like, the best video game players are the ones who have been the most caught up in the kind of reward system, right? It's like, I'm going to spend four solid days playing this new campaign or whatever, and I'm going to get all of the gold coins and all of the maps and all of the points and all of the leveling up of the whatevers and the whatevers, right? And so, like, you have been very well conditioned by this game to see every challenge all the way through. They've got your time. A lot of times they build purchases into the game, right? So if you want to level up, you've got to actually pay for it or you can like buy things that make leveling up easier. So they get your money along the way, right? So they keep you glued to the platform. You're having fun. You're, you're engaging in challenges and whatever. And then along the way, you're dropping more money, right? Because you need the upgrade. You need the add-on. You need to get the thing inside the thing to do the thing, right? Ching, 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 ching. Mom, I need your card, right? So, bravo. 
So there you go, gang. Um, 24, good. So the last few minutes is on this little op-ed piece on nudging. So the, the Catology stuff comes to us from 2003, I believe, was the publication date. And then this 2010 is when this uh, New York Times thing came out. This is in the Obama administration. And apparently Obama, who came out of the University of Chicago, there's lots of stuff in the University of Chicago, which historically is a very conservative institution. A lot of famous economists come out of University of Chicago, and there's even the University of Chicago School of Economics, and it's generally thought to be like probably the best elite institution that's also fairly conservative, which is unique for universities that are mostly pretty progressive. Um, and so apparently Obama brought on, uh, is it both of them, Thaler and Sunstein, or maybe just Sunstein, um, to help create effective policy goals right and so this gets rise to this gives rise to this business of nudging so captology is like computers but nudging is a kind of broader kind of catch-all way of thinking about the kind of stuff that fog is at but you can also think about nudging in a broader even non-computer kind of sense like for example the um the, the candy bars that you find at the checkout lane at the grocery stores, right? That is a way for these companies to nudge parents into buying things for their kids. If you're standing in line for a few minutes with a young kid and they're just standing there looking at the gum and the chocolate and the, they're going to bug you. And they're going to nudge and they're going to and they're going to nag. And so just by placing that stuff there they're persuading you to buy the product or they're increasing the chances that you're going to buy the product. This is known as nudging. It's a kind of behavioral um, conditioning, right? Where you place things. As they note in, as the, uh, the author notes in here, um, in a school cafeteria, if you put the fruit first, more students are going to take fruit. If you put fried chicken first, more students are going to take fried chicken. So the kind of overarching idea of nudging is whoever controls the menu controls the choices, right? And you can think of menu, right? You're handed a menu at a restaurant. It's like, these are the things that you are able to eat. That's it. These are your choices, right? We have come up with your choices for you. As the person, the parent who buys the groceries for my house, I control what my son eats more or less, right? And I try very hard to make sure that it's not too too bad and too, you know, processed and sugary and all the rest of it. Although it's hard because then there's his manipulation coming at me, which is please, please, please. <laughs> but this business of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs where Sunstein was working to help Obama sell his policies by nudging people, thinking about interest rates, thinking about discount rates, right? Like how is it using, again, using research from psychology, how can we get people to accept and adopt these be, these policy changes? So the one I wanted to kind of draw your attention to here is on the third page at the bottom here, and this is pretty much all I really wanted to sort of focus on. That last paragraph, in Nudge, a popular book that Sunstein wrote with influential behavior economist Richard Thaler, Sunstein elaborated a philosophy called libertarian paternalism. Conservative economists have long stressed that because people are rational, the best way for government to serve the public is to guarantee a fair market and to otherwise get out of the way. That is a serious man notion, right? It's like we are rational actors. Human beings are rational actors. So let us go into the marketplace, make our choices based on our own personal interests. We will always make the best, most rational choice. So get the government out of the market. That has long been the kind of baseline assumption of economics, right? But along comes this new sort of offshoot, this new thing called behavior economics, behavioral economics that's mentioned here. And what it's doing, it says in the, in the real world, Sunstein and Thaler argue, people are subject to all sorts of biases and quirks. Aha, this is key. They also argue that the human quality, which some would call irrationality, can be predicted. And this is the controversial part, that if the social environment can be changed, people might be nudged into more rational behavior. This is important. And then there's one more moment 
And I'll get to it in a second here. But this idea of the rational versus the irrational. The rational is the serious man. The irrational is the rhetoric man. And what's going on here is you have essentially these conservative serious man economists realizing that the truth is we are not actually rational down to the bottom. We are irrational. And so we have biases, we have irrational behaviors, we have quirks, we have susceptibilities, we have prejudices, and all this kind of weird stuff that make the serious man rational model approach seem laughable. So the question is, is what can you do about irrational behavior? And they're noting here that a lot of our irrational responses are actually predictable, right? So if that's the case, if you know that people have a presentist bias or an immediate bias because you see the fruit first and you're hungry now so you're going to go for the fruit then it makes good sense to put the healthy thing before the unhealthy thing unless you're the fried chicken company then you want the fried chicken first and the less right so it's all about knowing what tends to work in terms of our irrational minds and our irrational behaviors and and sort of using that to your advantage so the last thing in terms of the serious man rhetoric man business toward the end this is page 11, talking about how Sunstein went to University of Chicago. Um, and again, University of Chicago, a bunch of serious men, a bunch of conservative scholars who are all about rational actors and get the government out because the government can only make, you know, make things worse. When Sunstein and Thaler presented their attack using behavioral insights on the rational actor model that undergirded more traditional economic thinking, they delivered it to a tense classroom that included conservative skeptics. It was an atmosphere, Sunstein said, that felt a little like war. And here I am thinking about you've got these all these serious men and in come these rhetoric men basically saying all of your assumptions about the rational functioning of individual agents in society is totally misguided. We are irrational beings. We are biased. We are prejudiced. We are weak-willed. We are forgetful. We often make choices that completely go against our interests. When we're broke, we spend money on silly things for all kinds of strange reasons, right? So we must accept and embrace and work with the fact that irrationality is real. But we can predict the rationality using psychological analysis and research. And that is very much what is going on with both the computer captology stuff and a lot of nudging that's going on out there. So paternalistic liberalism or libertarian paternalism is this idea of libertarians are conservative. They want government, com they want government gone, basically. Um, what's the Senator Rand, the Rands, the Rand Pauls? Um, there's a couple of them. They're libertarians. They just want no government at all. Like, except for maybe, I don't know, war, military. Like, otherwise, just get the government out of everything. Let everyone have their complete, absolute, independent freedom to make their rational choices their way. So the nudge approach is to try and respect people's autonomy, their libertarian sort of free choice-making abilities. But the paternalism stuff is like, on the other hand, we do need to be nudged a little bit, right? It's like when I make sure to... When I go to the grocery store, I get a little bit of bad cereal, but I also get fruit. And so I'm nudging toward the fruit. That's me being paternalistic, literally father, right? I'm fathering my, my child, but I'm fathering that, that little guy in a, in a way that makes me feel like I'm doing good by him, by like making, helping him to make better, healthier choices. Because I know that if I filled the entire kitchen with crap, he would eat all of it, and that's bad. So it's a way of kind of limiting the space of choices to help funnel people in more positive directions. That can definitely seem as paternalistic. It can definitely feel like your agency is being taken away. But I don't know, maybe we need to get okay with the fact that we are surrounded by nudging efforts all the time when we go to the grocery store, the movie theater, anywhere pretty much. You know, There's this stuff that's kind of nudging us along and encouraging us to grab for this, the way that they display things here. They have display things at the end of the, of the, of the lanes. These are the specials. It's all about kind of where you're looking and what's catching you and how you're emphasizing and prioritizing and hierarchicalizing and all the rest of it. So our entire environments are curated, designed, persuasively engineered to get us to look, move, read, see, behave, bend in specific ways. It's a lot of, of 
stuff to be thinking about if you're concerned about influence and your own agency and what's coming at you. Just trying to bring out to the surface some of these um, more common but subtle uh, techniques of behavioral influence. So there you go. Video number two, 34 minutes. Not bad considering how much I had to get through there. One more on uh, Rush Coffin Media. Cool. See ya.